Hello, everyone, and welcome into Senior Living Live. My name is Melissa, and we welcome you to another webinar with our favorite money man, John Dove. He is a financial analyst with Edward Jones, who was extremely helpful uh, with his first webinar a couple of months ago about how to avoid scams. Today, he will be talking about tax-free investing. It's not what you make, it's what you keep. And we all wanna keep a little bit more money in our pockets, don't we? John has an excellent presentation to share with you today. And when he is finished, he will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Now, you can scroll down to the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A, type out your questions there. I will read them to John. John is also happy to hear any stories that you might have uh, about investing. So with that, I will turn the webinar over to John. John, take it away. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for um, taking the time this afternoon to join me. Uh, very excited to be here again. I think I'm an old pro now since I've been here once already. Um, so let's get started. First of all, let me just uh, say a little bit about myself again. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. I am a, a financial advisor here at Edward Jones Investments. I'm actually out here in Maryland in uh, Ellicott City. Uh, I'm always available to um, talk and discuss if any of this stuff resonates with you and you want to cover a little bit deeper, feel free to reach out to me. I'll share my contact information at the end. And Melissa, as you stated, uh, if anybody has any questions as we're going through it or a story that you'd like to share, please use that chat box at the bottom and then we'll be able to address all those questions at the end. So today we have a presentation that it's going to be a little bit uh, heavy and we have a lot of information to cover. So I'm, I'm going to kind of move a little bit quicker through some of this information, but I want to uh, focus on it so that focus on what's most important with it so we can cover some good information and, and you can have, uh, take, have a lot of takeaway from it. So let's get started. Again, it's called tax-free investing. It's not what you make, it's what you keep. That's the bottom line is we want to look at what opportunities there are to reduce your tax burden. Everyone always asks me, hey, I want to reduce how many taxes I pay. So first things first, with any type of goal, we really want to look at, um, we really want to first evaluate where you are and where you want to be. From there, we'll be able to set clear, measurable goals. And then we want to evaluate, hey, is this a realistic goal based on the time horizon, based on the investments that you have, that you're comfortable with? And then we want to evaluate what tools and strategies there are available. That's some of the things I'm going to cover today is some of those tools and strategies that some of those investment opportunities that you can take advantage of as a way to uh, uh, reach your long-term goals. And then most importantly is staying on track with these things and evaluating where you are, where you've been, have you achieved your goals? What, what do you need to adjust? Do you need to make some tweaks and some adjustments to your plan so that you can accomplish whatever your goal may be? And that's what today's seminar, again, it's just gonna be providing information on those tools and those strategies to get us where we need to be. So a few different things, just a little bit of an overview. We're gonna talk about a few individual investments, but then we're also gonna talk about some vehicles to get us to where we wanna be. So some of the things we're gonna talk about are actual individual bonds. We're gonna talk about something that's a unit investment trust, which don't be, a, it's kind of strange to hear, but it's basically a group of bonds. So you got individual bonds, you have maybe 10 to 20, bonds is a unit investment trust. Then you have a mutual fund, which might be maybe 100 to 200 different bonds. And then you have an exchange traded fund, which is, you know, maybe we're talking hundreds of different bonds. So that's the best way to kind of look at that. So you got individual bonds, singles, maybe 10 to 20 in the unit investment trust, maybe about 100 or so in a mutual fund. And then you might be looking at hundreds inside of exchange traded funds. Uh, then we're also going to talk about the vehicles that, that can accomplish some of these goals. So we're going to be looking at traditional and Roth IRAs. We're going to talk about 401ks and 403bs. And we're also going to touch on life insurance. Uh, I think all, these informa all of this is really going to be beneficial to really uh, evaluate how to reduce the amount of taxes that you pay and what can we do to accomplish some of these things. I also really want to cover some good information when it comes to beneficiary information and understanding, hey, what should, what, how should we strategize to leave to maybe a charity versus 
uh, a grandson or granddaughter or your, your kid. So I think it's also important to look at that because there's actually some tax um, strategies in place there to assist with that as well. All right, so let's keep moving here. Uh, what does tax exempt mean? Really, bottom line, tax exempt is tax free. That's the best way to think about that. So it's a tax free, tax exempt, tax free. You know, don't don't get caught up in too much of the jargon. Um, and so you don't have to pay federal taxes on it. All right, let's look at one investment that can be utilized is a municipal bonds. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've ever heard that before, muni bonds, uh, people talk about that. Most of them are tax-free, uh, so it has a tax-free status. Now, it's federally tax-free. There are some that are taxable, so I'm not gonna get into all that. I'm just gonna stick with the tax-free ones. And also something else to consider is if, if the bond is being offered by the state that you live in, then it might also be federal and state for, uh, tax free. But if you're buying into bonds that are in a different state, that would not be considered tax, state tax free. It might, it would still be federally bond, federally tax free, but not uh, within your state tax. So I think that's important to also talk about there. All right, so uh, benefits, obviously just tax free interest generated from the bonds. What a bond is, a very brief, brief overview, it's a debt instrument. So just like how uh, basically you have, you say for instance, a municipality or a county or a city wants to build a bridge or they wanna build something or build a school. What they can do is they say, hey, listen, we wanna raise some money to do this. Can we borrow from people? And in exchange for borrowing this money, we're gonna give you interest free, uh, payment uh, twice a year. So they'll pay you uh, the interest. So you're basically lending the county or the state money and they're gonna be paying you interest on that. And then they, they do it for a set amount of time. So it's very similar to, if you think about you know, your mortgage or something, it might be 20 years or 15 years. It's a little bit more of a long-term thing. But then at the end of that time frame, you get your money back. So you say, hey, I'm gonna lend it to you. You're gonna pay me interest. It's a good way to have some income. And then at the end of it, I'm gonna get all my money back. Um, so why, oh, excuse me, so why do this? Obviously, it, it's an opportunity to save, to, to create a uh, set of income that's, that's dependent, dependable, right? So you know that you're going to be receiving that income uh, twice a year. So that's, that's the why people do these things. They typically are a little bit lower interest, depends, depends on when you've gotten into them. There's a lot of variety, we'll, we'll talk about all all right, let's take a look at the IRS form 1040. There's two different line items on there. We got line item 8, 8A, which is your taxable interest. And then we have uh, 8B, which is your tax-free income. So the idea here is we want to move more money from the uh, 8A to 8B. So that's the idea there. We want to reduce the amount of taxes that we have to pay on that side. So reducing your taxable income. So obviously there's a couple of different things. There's taxable, tax advantage bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, uh, but then there's also retirement accounts. You know, people have uh, 401ks, they have IRAs, they might have a 403b, those sorts of things. Those, those are all ways to help reduce the amount of taxable income that you earn. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of something called tax freedom day, but essentially that's the amount of time that you, you Essentially, this is the, um, the date that you've earned enough money to pay for your federal tax, uh, your federal taxes. So you work for the first four months of the year just to pay your taxes. And then after that, you're, it's the tax freedom day. Kind of interesting that it falls on April 15th. So it's very interesting that it falls on there, or around that time frame. Uh, so, okay, so what's all the fuss about this tax free versus taxable? And does it really make a big difference? Let me show you something that I think is going to be really important. So let's look at this. This is a great illustration. And so we have a couple of different pie charts there. And the white there is how much uh, federal taxes are paid. And what we're going to do is we're going to use an example of an investor who earns uh, is an investor who earns on a one hundred thousand dollar taxable investment, which is yielding five percent. So one hundred thousand dollars. Um, they're in this, this first circle here, they're in the 24% tax bracket, 
they earn 5% on that $100,000 taxable investment. Uh, in that case, uh, she pays $1,200 in federal taxes, uh, and then she gets to keep the $3,800. All right, let's look at a, the next investor. Uh, this investor here, uh, then the 37% tax bracket, they pay $1,850 in taxes, and they get to keep $3,150. All right, now let's compare that to a tax-free investment uh, for that same person who's in the 37% uh, tax bracket. It doesn't matter because it's all tax-free and so they get to keep $4,000. So that's the idea is it's a lower yielding investment. They're only gonna be yielding 4%, but bottom line is what do they get to keep in their pocket? They get to keep more. So although it's a lower tax rate or it's a lower interest rate, instead of being 5%, it's 4%. But look what happens because they don't have to pay taxable income. They actually uh, benefit from that and they actually get to keep more, more in your pocket, right? And less to the federal government. All right, let's take a little quick peek now too as to the tax brackets. And that's something to, important to consider is what tax bracket you're in. And this table here, this shows how it is, uh, what the individual tax brackets are. Um, again, the, uh, there's also something called a uh, taxable equivalent yield. So I'm gonna break that down here in a minute. So you first you wanna kind of pick out which tax bracket you're in here. So let's say we're in the 24% tax bracket. Uh, looking at that one here as a single person, it would be 85,000 to 163, or as a joint couple between 171 and 326. So that's in the 24% tax bracket. And we have something called the taxable or tax equivalent yield. I'm going to show that to you. It'll make sense here in just a sec. Over there on the left-hand side, it says tax-free yield. And so we're showing 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%. And then across the top there, we have the different tax brackets, 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, 37. All right, let's look at that 24% tax bracket. And that scan down, and let's just use that one on the bottom, the 6.93. And now let's compare that to the tax-free yield of 5%. So the taxable equivalent yield of a tax-free bond that's paying 5% would be a taxable investment that's paying 6.93. Uh, and I hope that makes sense. Uh, it, it, it can be a little confusing this first time around, uh, but I just want to clarify, I'm, I'm going to say it one more time. If, if you were to buy into a tax-free bond, for instance, and let's say it paid uh, 5%, well, you would need to find something that pays 6.93, almost 7%, to, to offset those same, you know, to take home the same amount of income. All right, so that's a lot of good information. It's, it's a lot to digest. Again, if you have any questions, reach out. Also, you can chat, put it into the chat box here. So let's keep things moving along. Like I said earlier, I, I tried to summarize this so that we can kind of go through this a little bit quicker. Uh, you have individual bonds. Like I said, I, I'm in Howard County. So there's a Howard County bonds. And so in this county, you know, they offer individual bonds. Maybe they want to do some improvements. They want to build a hospital. They want to do something. So they put it out and say, hey, listen, we want to raise money for this hospital. Can we borrow from the community? And the community lends it to them. They say, hey, okay, over the next 20 years, we're going to pay you X interest, whatever that might be. And they'll pay you those interest, that interest over the next 20 years. Um, another option is is this, uh, well, then is unit investment trust. Well, we're gonna go into that in a minute in the mutual fund and the ETFs. We're gonna go into that. Let's stick with the individual bonds. Let's talk about some of that a little bit deeper because there's risks that associated with it. I wanna make sure that we talk about a few individual things with that. So again, they can be exempt. It's a semi-annual payment. It's a fixed interest rate. You have a fixed maturity date. Sometimes there's something called callable bonds I'm not gonna to go too deep into that, but sometimes there's an option to call. It's just like how right now interest rates are low. People wanna refinance their home. 
this is an opportunity for uh, um, one of these municipalities to say, hey, listen, I want to refinance. You know what? I, I put this out there. Interest rates were high back then. I want to refinance and I want to I want to pay back the principal and I want to get some some put something out there for a lower interest rate. So that's what calling calling back bonds are. You may encounter it over time. It's, it's just something for you to know about. Uh, may you uh, may you own more than unit investment trusts or similar bonds. Um, there's a minimum purchase associated with it, um, and also, you know, there there's uh, some risks associated with these individual bonds, and we want to talk about that too because uh, it's just like a you know we all have our credit score, so uh, municipalities and corporations and things have their own credit score, and that that really is this. Uh, you all may have heard of this before. This is like the Moody's and the Standard and Poor. So basically it's it's a rating to say, hey, what's the odds that you're gonna default on your loan? So if you have a real high credit score, you, you pay your bills. Same thing with municipalities. If you have a AAA rated, that's a very high investment grade bond. And so you know that you're gonna get paid. So you know what ends up happening is sometimes people uh, don't, don't necessarily have the best credit rating and these companies are these uh, institutions do not have the best credit credit rating, and so what do they do? They offer a higher interest rate. So if they high offer a higher interest rate, you might be sucked into, oh hey wow I can I can uh, get this high interest rate, but you want to look at it because we want to make sure that it's not going to have um, a default associated with it either. So you really don't want there to be a default associated with that either. And so that's so it's always important also to look at the bond rating for municipalities and also corporations. So corporations offer bonds too. Corporate bonds, they're not tax free, but hey, they offer them. You wanna look at what the credit rating is on those as well. All right, so we've, we've covered this a little bit. Um, the line there between triple B and double B is the difference between investment grade and the below investment grade. So let's keep things moving right along. Again, I mentioned a couple of risks. One thing to consider is you have a fixed interest rate. And so you have this fixed interest rate and say you do a 20 year or a 30 year bond and you say, hey, I'm good with getting that income, that income from that uh, amount of money. And you'll, you'll get it you know, twice a year, you're gonna get this payment. There's an interest rate risk, right? With, or there's a couple of different risks things. First, there's an inflation risk. So that number is never gonna change. You know, cost of goods, cost of living, everything else changes over time but you're not gonna ever have an increase in the amount of income that you receive on that. So I think that's important to take into consideration. Um, that's, that's a big, big priority there that you wanna understand. Um, let's see what else here. Um, talked about lower rated bonds. They have a little higher fluctuation. Uh, with these things too, you can always sell. So a lot of these bonds, if you buy into something, you could turn around and sell it. But let me give you an example. And this is actually a great example here. My grandmother, and this is a fun little story here. Uh, about 30 years ago, my grandmother got a bond and it paid 8%. And it's an 8% bond. And uh, it was a 30 year bond for 8% tax free. And so she's been living off that. That's been great. You know, that's been fantastic. That's a good, that's a fantastic uh, rate, but things like that change. And so if, 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 you know what, 10 years ago when interest rates are, are low, if she said, hey, I need to have that money, I, she could turn around and sell that. And she'd probably sell it for a premium, you know, because people say, oh, wow, that pays 8%. I really want to buy that. I need to sell that. You know, I want to buy that uh, bond for 8%. I'll pay it a little bit more now. I'll pay for that because I want to have that fixed income. The reverse of that would be if, if you buy into a bond at a low interest rate and interest rates go up and then you know 10 years, 15 years down the road, you say, hey, uh, I have this really low interest rate bond and now interest rates are you know, being offered at five, six, seven, eight percent and you have a little 2% bond and you need to sell it, it's gonna be hard to find a buyer because people are like, oh, I can just go out and get a new bond for five, six, seven, eight percent Whereas you're trying to sell me a, a 2% bond, you know what, you can give me a discount on that. 
and then potentially I'll buy into it. So that's something to just consider. Again, this is a little bit heavy, a lot of information here, but uh, I wanted to go through it with you. If you have questions, again, chat box, we'll cover it at the end here. Um, again, also when you buy into a bond, an individual bond, you know, it's just one bond as opposed to there's no diversification. We don't have a lot of opportunities there. You know, if you're going to get into something like that, we actually suggest you get into at least maybe 10 different bonds because you want to spread out your risk. You want to spread things out a little bit. But, you know, you don't want to keep all your uh, eggs in one basket. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about these unit investment trusts. I'm going to go briefly on this because we've covered what a bond is, how it works. These next three are just the different vessels of how they are done. So unit investment trusts, instead of one bond, you get 10 bonds, you know? It's professionally managed. You have a, a, somebody who's managing this, they're monitoring it, they're changing things out. Um, you get immediate diversification because you're buying into you know, 10, 20 different bonds. Uh, you run the same risk associated with the individual bond. You can sell it, but you know what? If interest rates have gone up, then you know you might have to sell it at a little bit of a discount. If interest rates have gone down, then hey, you might get a premium for it. All right, um, all right. Let's keep moving here. Think about a mutual fund too. I'm going to talk about this too because this is another opportunity: is mutual funds. So there's bonds that are in mutual funds. There's, they're called bond funds. So just like how you have stocks inside of mutual funds, there's stock. There's mutual funds that are stock oriented, and then there's mutual funds that are bond oriented. So it works the same way. Now, talk about instant, uh, uh, talk about instant diversification. Now we're talking, you know, almost a hundred different bonds. You were really, you know, th this money manager has now come in, accumulated all these different bonds, and then they say, hey, we're going to pay you a set amount of uh, income, and you're going to get this income. They're going to take all this. They're going to manage it for you, and they're going to dish it out. It's a great way. It's easier to manage as a, a self-investor. That's something that you do and have also the benefit of, you, you could find benefits of the federally tax-free if you find a, call it a muni bond fund. So talk to your financial professional about that and, and ask them in, in, in regards to that. Uh, okay, how about ETFs? That's buzzword. I mean, we're talking, we have some acronyms here, right? So exchange traded funds, uh, what that is, is what that really comes down to is that is a, we're, we're going into, it's very passive, so it's a lower cost. Uh, they're designed to track performance on an index. Uh, they select securities that are going to replicate that index. And as a result, you can get broad exposure across big asset classes, provides for good portfolio diversification. But keep in mind, Diversification doesn't, you know, guarantee profit, protect against loss, and also, you know, you you put it out there, you're going to get some of the good ones and the bad ones. So you talk about, uh, you know, when I'm talking about the uh, Standard and Poor and like the credit scores and things like that, you're looking, okay, we're going to get everybody. You're going to have the good and the bad. That's how. That's what falls into those ETFs. If I was going to suggest something, you want to look a little bit more, especially with the bond side. Uh, it's it's pretty standard that a, a money manager or a professional that manages it can outperform the index with ETFs in the bond market. Uh, not always, but that's something that you want to look at. So sometimes when you build a portfolio, there are certain things that maybe you don't want to have in the passive side of things. All right, let's keep things rolling. We talked about the mutual funds. We talked about the risks associated with that. Uh, we talked about the ETFs and the risks, same thing. You know, you're, it's easily accessible. So that's the benefits of these things is you can sell. If you need the money, you can sell it. You know, it's not, not a risk of, oh, I bought, I bought into an individual bond that's, that is sell, that's gonna mature in 25, 30 years. Instead, it's, it tra it's traded daily. It's something that if you need the money, you can pull from it. It's not gonna run a risk of, of having like being locked in for good. So that's a great reason to utilize uh, at least the mutual funds in, in my opinion on that side. Okay, so now we've, so we've covered that. Great, thank you guys. I've kept you so far for 27 minutes, we're doing great. Next thing that we're gonna talk about is like the vehicles for tax-free investing. 
So we've talked about an individual investment that was the municipal bonds, that's tax-free. Now we're gonna talk about the vehicles for that. So may, many of you, and, and I wanna make sure that you stick with me here because I'm gonna talk about something when we talk about uh, beneficiaries and reasons to use certain platforms for uh, beneficiaries. So we're gonna go over that after we cover the three, the three topics here. So first let's talk about IRAs. So there's two different types. There's a traditional IRA, and then there's a Roth IRA. What's the difference? What's the difference, right? So traditional tax deferred. So you're gonna pay the taxes. You're deferring paying taxes until you retire and you take your money out. You're deferring that money. Roth tax free. So there's conditions, there's requirements, there's income limits, there's all these different things that have to fall into categories for Roths. Same even with traditionals, but with those, it's tax-free. So you, you put the money in there, it grows over the, over the number of years. And now when you pull from that, that's tax-free. You don't pay income tax on that at that point. All right, so let's keep things rolling. Let's talk about this a little bit uh, deeper in debt or, or, or deeper, deeper in depth here. Um, and, and also, with the, so this goes in hand with this too, is 401ks, 403bs. They're treated very much like a uh, traditional IRA, right? So you earn money, you say, hey, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna do pre-tax contributions. It redu reduces your, your taxable income now. They take that money, they put it in this vehicle and then over the course it grows. And then now when you retire, you take from it and now you have to pay taxes. Okay, within 401ks, they also have some employer sponsored plans as you're working. And this might be something to share with you know, your kids and grandkids and things like that too. So make sure you're, you're sharing this with, with your friends and, and other people too. So with Roths, they do have Roth 401k options sometimes. So it depends on the employer, it depends on the, the plan. But that is really great too, because now they have a 401k option and then they also have a Roth 401k option. So you can be putting money in before tax, after tax, you kind of you really diversify. And this is great down the road because once you retire, you don't want to only be pulling from taxable stuff. You don't want to only be pulling from 401k IRA. You want to have another bucket. You want to have the other bucket that says, hey, this is tax free. I can take money out of this and I don't have to pay taxes. You know, you have a vacation coming up or um, expense or an unexpected thing. You don't want to always be taxed on your income. So you want to be able to have a couple different bu buckets to choose from. And that's what this really helps with. All right, so let's keep things happening. Another one is life insurance. Life insurance, the death benefit is tax-free, okay? And then there's also, uh, there's also a couple different types. So there's permanent, there's uh, term. So the term versus term, there's different types, different features for each one. There's different advantages for each one. I'm not gonna go into all that, but the biggest thing with that is the death benefit is federally income tax free. So I wanna cover this point now. I'm gonna take the moment now to do this. When we talk about these things, I wanna give you a scenario. Let's say you have kids, you have grandkids, and let's say you also you have a charitable organization, maybe, maybe a church or a nonprofit or something that you like to give to. So what we wanna do is we want you wanna think about how should you designate your beneficiaries and talk to a financial professional and, 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 and find out what would be the most tax advantaged approach to that? And you might even want to talk to a CPA because a CPA might be able to offer some insight too, but you can start with a financial professional. They can help you with kind of directing you to, towards that. But I'm giving you an example because this is important. This is important stuff. So let's, let's use, um, let's say you have a life insurance policy Let's say you have a retirement account, an old 401k or an IRA. And then let's say that you just have some money. You know, you just got some cash in the, in the bank, right? So you have a couple different platforms. So you got your tax deferred, so that's your IRA. You have your life insurance, which is gonna be tax-free to whoever receives it. And then you have just your investment accounts, right? So one, one thing to keep in mind is um, recently the government, the federal government made a change in the law. And what that is, that change in that law essentially was this. So let's say that you have an IRA, you pass away, and so your spouse is the um, re receives that. So you, you put them on that, they receive it, 
they can take the distributions. They have to take their required minimum distributions or what have you, but it's based off of their age and they can do that for the rest of their life. And you used to be able to give that to your kid or your grandkid, and then they could do that from the rest of their life. So let's use an example. Let's say that you had some money and, and you left it to your, your son or your daughter and they were 25 years old when, when you passed away. Well, at 25, they can, they have to, every year they'd have to take a little bit of money all the way through until they're retired, they're done too. So it was, it was really spread out. So instead what they've done is they've changed the law to say, hey, listen, you have 10 years. If it's not a spouse, that's important. If it's not a spouse, if it's a child, grandchild, whatever, you have 10 years. And at the end of the 10 years, doesn't matter what that retirement account is, it has to be $0 at the end of the 10 years. So it creates an, an incentive for the federal government to get paid on those taxes. And it creates an incentive for the child or the grandchild or whoever it may be to take that distribution within a time frame. They give them 10 years, as opposed to spreading it out over the course of 20, 30, 40 years, federal government got sick and not get paid, right? So that's, that's the premise behind it. With that in mind, you want to start to think about things, right? So let's say you have a nonprofit. You could designate the nonprofit as the beneficiary of your tax deferred IRA. Guess what? They don't pay taxes when they get that. So you could designate that to your uh, to a nonprofit. They receive that money. They don't have to pay taxes. So think about the value there. They don't have to worry about that. And then think about changing the, you know, making the beneficiary of like a life insurance policy. Um, maybe that could be a child or a grandchild. Like there's a lot of flexibility, but you want to just talk to a professional about that and, and see what they have to say. So anyways, I just want to make sure I shared that with you guys because I think that's a really important factor. Okay, so this is a, this slide here is packed full of information. It's basically covering everything we talked about interest rates, maturities. We're talking about the different ways of bonds versus you know, investment trusts, mutual funds, ETFs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move right through that. And I can share this, these slides. If somebody wants this, feel free, again, reach out to me. I'm gonna put my contact information here at the end and I can share these slides to you. You can shoot me an email and say, hey, can you, can you send me those slides? And I'm happy to send it over to you. Um, no issue there at all. All right, so let's keep things going. All right, so we've covered a lot. We've, we've talked about individual bonds, the, the uh, benefit of those. We've talked about unit investment trusts where it's professionally managed, but hey, it's maybe you know 10 to 20. You get some diversification, uh, professionally managed, monitored. It's a good way to have consistent income. And also as appropriate, it could be federal and maybe even state tax income exempt. Mutual funds built in diversification. It's professionally managed. Uh, same thing, tax, federally tax-free if you get into a municipal bond mutual fund. Okay. ETFs, diversification, same thing, tracks the index. Passive, it's actually one thing that's not written there is low cost, you know, right? So uh, a lot of those passive investments, those ETFs, have a lower cost because they don't have somebody professionally managing them. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I'll leave that. Up. I'll leave that to you for you to decide. Uh, all right. When we've talked about uh, Roths, we've talked about traditional IRAs. We've talked about 401ks, 403bs. Those are like your employer-sponsored plans. Uh, like I said, the IRAs may be tax deductible. I'll, I'll talk about that right now. Just to make sure I cover that. Which is, let's say, for instance, you make a hundred thousand dollars this year. If you made a hundred thousand dollars. You'd have to pay taxes on a hundred thousand dollars. But if you took and you put away $6,000 into an IRA, now you'd only have to pay taxes on 94,000. That's the tax deductible side. So if you contribute to that IRA, you reduce your taxable, the taxes that you have to pay, $6,000, hey, any, anywhere where we can save it is good. Same with a Roth IRA, with a Roth IRA, you don't get to take that tax deduction, but you pay the taxes, you put that money away, it grows tax-free. Like I said, we wanna have a couple different buckets. These are the three buckets that maybe you wanna have. You wanna have your IRA, you wanna have your tax-free Roth IRA, 
And then maybe you have your 401k, which you can roll into a traditional IRA. Uh, and then obviously you want to protect yourself and you can use life insurance as a way, as a means to do that. You protect your loved ones. Um, there's different types of life insurance. I'm not going to get, this is not a life insurance program. I'm not trying to do anything with this, but it's important to protect yourself and say, hey, listen, there's permanent life insurance, there's term. You got to find what's a good fit for you and understand the ramifications too of if something were to happen to you, how is that paid out? And, and understanding that that's a tax free. Maybe you don't want to, maybe you don't want to leave a tax free benefit to a nonprofit who already doesn't pay taxes. Instead, maybe you want to make the beneficiary of a life insurance policy be an individual, you know? And one other thing too, we didn't even cover because it's, it's not in this program, but uh, 529 education plans is another thing to consider when you're thinking about your kids and your grandkids and, and different opportunities. There's ways to, ways to maneuver and uh, help your, your kids with that type of investment, which is also grows tax-free as long as it's used for educational expense. All right, so I've covered a lot, guys. Um, I'm gonna leave, open it up for question and answer. And when we do that too, I'm gonna put my, uh, my information here on the screen. I'm gonna make that big. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, you can email me, you can call me. Uh, you, I got my website up there too. Um, and then obviously Melissa and everybody's gonna have my information too. So I'm gonna open it up now for questions. Uh, and Melissa, I uh, hope you can take it away and uh, share whatever questions we have. And, I, and again, I hope we can have some discussion too, uh, if, if you guys have any questions or, or comments. John, great presentation again today. Sure. Um, so our first question, uh, I wanna go to our chat because this one came from uh, JC and this came very early on in the conference call. Uh, JC asked, so you can get guaranteed interest but can lose on principal if bond sells lower than you bought it. Correct. And that would be if you sell it prior to maturity. So that's important to understand. They'll put in, they'll say, hey, listen, you can buy into this and this will be the interest that you'll receive. And it's going to mature in 20 years. And they'll say, hey, as long as you keep it through that time, they'll pay back the principal. Now, if in the meantime, at some point you say, hey, I want to sell that. I need to get that money. At that point, you can lose principal because it's that it kind of comes down to that interest rate risk, where if interest rates have gone up and you own this bond down here, it's going to be hard for you to compete with the marketplace, which are offering interest rates way up here. And so you'd be you'd have to sell it at a discount. And that's very confusing stuff, but I appreciate you following along with that. And like I say, I'm happy to go a little bit deeper in depth on that too. Yeah, and, and JC, uh, again, if, if you need a little bit more clarity, feel free to uh, type in another question in the chat box. And that's for everybody watching, by the way. Uh, down at, at the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A, that is where you can type out your question. I will read them to John and we will make sure we get them answered. Uh, we're going to try to go to the top of the hour, guys. And if we have to go over uh, because of the questions, we are happy to do that. We want to make sure we get them all answered today. Um, JC says thanks. I saw so that. you okay. did a great job. Good. <laughs> all right. The next question. Um, uh, well, this comes from JC. Let me just get the follow up here because we are on this question. Uh, if a bond is called before maturity, do you get all your principal back? Yes. Yes. So it's, it's the same deal that it's, remember we said if they want to refinance, there's a call option that they put in there. Not all bonds have call options, but it's a call option. It's, and that's the easiest way to think about it. It's a refinance. They want to refinance it. If they refinance it, they'll still give you back your principal and then they'll, they'll move on and, and do a different investment. Thank you. Sure. Excellent. <laughs> all right. To Susan now, Susan says with 529, what if uh, grandkids uh, or a grandkid doesn't go to college? What is the downside of UGTM account and who pays taxes? Okay, so the, with the 529, uh, there's a couple of good benefits there. So one thing too, yeah, people may not necessarily go to, 
go to college. So what is what options do we have there? Worst case scenario, and this is the worst case scenario. So I'll give you the better better side first, and then we'll talk about worst case. The better side is it can be always transferred to somebody else. So think about this. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to, to, to pay for college for your, your grandson or granddaughter? And then worst case scenario, what if you moved it to their kids? You know, if they don't go to college, you can actually move the beneficiary. And one other crazy thing is you can actually list the beneficiary before you even have somebody. So people think about it, they they're new, they're gonna have kids, they wait till they have the baby to have a 529 plan. You don't even need to do that. You could actually put the 529 in your name. And then once you have the baby, at that point, you could start it. So it's really, really interesting there. Um, with the UTGMAs and, and the different types, there's that's a whole nother gamut. And I'm happy to go a little bit deeper into that another time, not today. But with that in mind, uh, you want to think about uh, when kids are going to college, the, it's it comes down to the um, the uh, federal um, federal taxes and things like that. The federal loan programs. It's more like the loan programs, like the FAFSA. I knew it was right on the tip of my tongue. The FAFSA and things like that, where those are the ones that come into play. And also, they they take into consideration the parents' income. But when you're looking at putting money into a 529 plan or just an investment account for your for your granddaughter, grandson, whatever, that's not going to have a big implication. Uh, it's more focused on, you know, their um, their income as a parent providing it to them. So it's less about the investments that they have. They're not going to like really hit them hard because they because you you took steps to save money for them. Um, and then to uh, one other thing, just the last thing, the worst case with the 529s would be. If you need to use it for something other than education, guess what? You have to pay a penalty, but it's a 10% penalty. It's not a huge deal. And it, it's a bad, I mean, it's a bad rap, but think about this. If you put it into a tax-free and it's grown, and then now we have to take 10% of it and pay. You've still got a lot of big tax-free growth in there that you can take out and yeah, you got to pay a penalty on it, but it's just one of those things that, that needs to take into consideration. Hope that answers your question, Susan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Susan, if you have uh, maybe an additional question or follow-up, feel free to add that to the chat box or to the Q&A. We will move on now to Don and Jackie. Uh, they ask, John, what can you say about preferred stocks as an income investment? Anything in unis here? Yeah, so I think with um, preferred stocks and things like that, there are some with with munis i think there's some options there um it's a, it, that what that comes down to again is like credit ratings right so with credit ratings and stocks and and municipal uh, municipal bonds so we want to if, if you have an opportunity to get into a preferred stock where the, they're, they're bringing that on into the marketplace and it seems like it's a good option for you and you think it's a good quality long-term investment you know what stocks pay dividends and but with that in mind you're not going to have um it's not going to be tax free you know so it's it's going to be in the taxable side it can go into your vehicle it can go into your uh roth ira account but it won't be tax free excellent that takes us to our next question and it is uh roth ira is uh, included in this question it comes from joan uh, what strategy do you suggest one consider when thinking about converting some money using a Roth IRA conversion? That's a great question. So that's really important to do with that. I see your question here, Susan, too. I saw that pop up. Um, but to answer your question about the Roth conversions, what that comes down to is how many, you know, pe people have that as an option, right? You have money inside of a retirement account and you can convert some of that inside of that traditional IRA, because I'm going to explain it a little bit. You have it inside of that traditional IRA, you can convert it to a Roth. What do you have to do to do that? You have to pay the taxes on that. So people consider that of, okay, am I in a lower tax bracket today? Are taxes going to go up in the future? Am I going to be in a higher tax bracket in the future? So you want to think about your individual situation, not to mention 
nationally and the political climate that we're in, are we going to have taxes be raised in the future, down the road? You know, are we in the lowest tax bracket? So a lot of people are thinking, hey, listen, tax cuts have happened. We're in a lower tax bracket. If I have to pay 20% right now to move this over into a conversion and now it's tax free, and now it's gonna grow tax free down the road, if I, if taxes are 35% or 40%, you know what? I'd rather have done it now rather than wait. So I think it's important to juggle the, the, the different buckets, find out what's a appropriate fit for you as an individual. Uh, also the, how much you're gonna be paying on your income tax. So again, if you're earning a lot of money, that might not be the best time to do that. But if, you know, you, you know, people have been unemployed this year and if they got unemployed and now their, their income has reduced over the past year, well, now might be a time to do a little bit of a conversion because it doesn't put you up into that next tax bracket. Uh, these are all great questions to also talk to a CPA about and a CPA can help guide you with, hey, let's go ahead and do that. And then let's work with your financial professional to, to do those things. Excellent. So I'm skipping around here with some of these questions to try okay. to lump um, some similar topics together sure. and continue with IRA and Roth IRA. And this comes from, I think it's Dia or D. Uh, how difficult is it to move money from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA? And what are the consequences of doing it? So easy to do. Uh, it's, it's literally a push of a button once you have the two set up. Um, if, if you don't have two of them set up, you just have to set up the other one and then you can do it. The consequences are the taxable income. You're gonna be paying taxes to convert it into a Roth. So you're gonna to have to pay the taxes, you're gonna convert it to a Roth. Um, keep in mind, I'm gonna share one thing too. Both of them have the same limit. So uh, if you're over 50, it's 7,000. If you're under 50, it's 6,000, but it's the same amount of money. So you can't do six and six or seven and seven you could do four and three or four and yeah, four and three or four and two or whatever, depends on where you are. Um, but it's that same amount of money. And then you got your 401ks, which I didn't put into this program, but the 401ks, they have a different threshold as to what that amount is. I think it's like 19,000 and then it's 26,000. I think once you're over 50 and what happens is that over 50, they do catch ups. So it gives you an opportunity to say, Hey, I should have been saving more. I wish I had, I wish I knew what I knew now, what I knew then, right? I think that's a song. Um, but being able to do that and be able to catch up is, is what those limits uh, relate to. I have a question before we leave. Uh, you, you had mentioned 401k, uh, IRAs. So can you talk about um, what the coronavirus and namely the CARES Act has done in terms of maybe not penalizing you for, for taking out some of that money if you need it? That is a really interesting uh, idea. And people have taken advantage. It's a way to take advantage of this. So let's say that you were employed and uh, you lost your job and times are tough. And let's say you're not 60, you're not retired. You know, you're in your forties or fifties and times are tough and it's been, you know, a couple months unemployed and you're trying to figure things out. There's some opportunities with IRAs and with 401ks where you can actually take a distribution and you won't have a penalty. So they put a penalty usually on there. Uh, uh, same thing, a 10% penalty that they would typically penalize you with if you took an early distribution. So there's some really cool things with this because it's important to know and you can, you can take advantage of it and try to utilize it to your benefit. Um, Basically, the only stipulations is that you were affected by COVID in some way. So with that in mind, some people can take advantage of it and say, hey, you know what, I, I needed to, to pay down some credit card debt or I needed to do this. All this money is in my retirement account. Uh, I want to be able to take some of that and pay down some of my credit card debt. And you know what, it, it's okay to do that in this type of situation. It's an interesting situation. Another factor with that, and let me, let me get into the details. I'm getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty, okay? So it caps off at you can take up to $100,000 as a distribution uh, in this year. So you can take up to $100,000. 
you would still have to pay income tax. But here's the kind of the cool thing. You can actually split that up over the next three years. So if you took out $100,000, typically, you know, you're going to be responsible. Let's keep numbers simple, right? Say you take out $100,000, let's say you're in the 10% thing, and you're going to owe $10,000 in taxes. Well, instead of having to come up with $10,000 in April, you can split that up over the next three years and pay taxes back over the next three years as an option there. Um, and the other cool thing is, let's say in two years, things are good, you got your job back, things are rolling, you could call and say, hey, I took out that $100,000, I wanna put that back. I'm ready to put that money back in. And now we're not limited to the 401k contributions or the IRA, the six, $7,000, and say, you can say, hey, I'm gonna put all that money back in there. So it's a good opportunity to use it if you needed it. You know, you never want to touch your retirement account if you don't have to, but it's a tool that you could utilize if you needed it. And obviously, I'm sure everyone knows, no RMDs this year. So you don't have any required minimum distributions. Uh, that was the other thing is because of COVID, they are saying, hey, if typically you had to take a RMD, you don't have to do it this year. So they, you get one year, <laughs> one year free there, essentially, where you don't have to pay the government their taxes. So really a time to, to take advantage. I mean, it's all about tax-free investing. This is what the presentation is about. And the government is saying, hey, guys, we've got a couple of freebies for you, but it, there's a time limit on it. And there's certain stipulations, as you mentioned. Now, I don't know if this falls under that particular situation, but Mary asked, if you have an existing IRA, I thought there was no limit on the amount, i.e. not a $7,000 limit, you can move to a Roth. Is that correct? That is correct. So if you have it in a traditional IRA and you're going to convert it, so there's conversions. If you're going to convert it to a Roth, you're not limited on that. But if it's a new contribution, that new contribution in that year, that's where the 7,000 or the 6,000 has come into play. So if you wanna put more money into the IRA, that's where it is. There's converting it and then there's the other one. And I'll, I'll share one other thing just because it's obviously an overrun of information, but I'm still giving it to you. Another one is called a, a backdoor Roth. And so Roth have stipulations of income limits. And so you can, you know, if you're in the $200,000 range as an individual, you might not qualify to put money into a Roth, but they actually have ways where basically you're putting it into a traditional IRA and then you're converting it to a Roth in the same year. And so it's just a way to make a, you know, they always find ways to get around things and try to uh, uh, take advantage of whatever little thing they, they, they messed up on. All right, we're getting closer to the top of the hour. We have two questions left, uh, one from Marilyn, and I want to hold Susan's for the last okay. question. Okay. I think I know what Susan so, is. <laughs> Marilyn asks, uh, why would they call a bond to refinance? What does that do to the interest rate, which was paid, and then what they pay after the refinance? Yep, so if, if it was a call, right? So if it was like, a, that, that's, they, they would refinance essentially. So if, if they called it, let's say, let's give the example that my grandmother had, right? So they had, they were paying 8%. They were paying 8%. So let's say they had put a call stipulation after 10 years. It's a 30 year bond. And let's say after 10 years, they had the call option and interest rates went from 8% down to 2%. And now if you went to try to borrow money or whatever, you'd be paying 2%. two percent. So interest rates have dropped. So from that municipalities or that corporation's perspective, they're paying you 8% for, your, for borrowing your money. Instead, they have an opportunity to, to pay 2%. So they're going to take advantage of that call option. They're going to say, hey, I borrowed $10,000 from you. I'm going to pay you back your 10,000. So I'm going to give you back your principal. We're not changing, you know, your principal isn't affected. You're going to get your money back. And instead we're going to reissue a bond and the interest rate is going to be at 2%. And because that's what the interest rate marketplace is, people are going to buy into it at a 2% bond rate. 
hope that's clear. Again, if I if if I overcomplicate things, I apologize, but I'm happy to um, answer questions as a follow up too. If you have any individual situations, reach out to me. I'm happy to address them. It's clear you enjoy what you do. I do. And Thanks. I think it's very refreshing uh, to see that sort of gusto from from somebody. I know you're a former farmer, and I know you've you've made this now a career, and you're excellent at what you do. Um, and so here comes the the opinion part. Uh, and the last question, and you already know what it is. And the yep. question comes from Susan. Do you think the market will crash after the election? Oh my gosh. So no one knows what's going to happen with the election. You know, we've past couple of days, we've had some down market days. Yeah. I would encourage lean into this, that, respectively, lean into some of these down days. If things are down, Things can continue to go down. But just like in March, we were having these discussions. You know, we were talking about this sort of thing of, hey, uh, the market's going down. It's never going to come back. It's never going to, and, and it's doomsday. And then it's come back and it's gotten back to where it is. With elections, no one knows, and, and we're, no one knows what's going to happen. And truthfully, all you can do is you can look back to say, hey, you know, if it's a Democrat, if it's a Republican, what's the benefit? Which one's going to be the better payoff? No one knows. And I'll give you a quick example to leave you on this too. Quick example is when Trump was going to be elected initially in 2016, I heard this on Bloomberg. They said, oh, the, the two industries that are going to be really good are energy and finance because he's going to lighten up restrictions. He's going to be a good, a good person for that. And that's what everyone thought. And they were, they were right with Trump, right? They knew that Trump was going to, they, they said, if Trump wins, this is going to be the thing. So position your portfolio, right? Energy and finance are the lowest performing over the past four years, right? So even if you know the, the, the result, even if you know it's going to be Biden or it's going to be Trump, even if you know who the, the winner is going to be, are you going to be able to position your portfolio to take into that consideration? Or is the marketplace still not going to adapt to that the way that you may think it's going to. So stick to long-term, ride it out. If you have the money available and, and it's a, and market goes down, that's a good time to put money in. But one thing you could do when we're talking Roth conversions and IRA conversions is if you have your money in a, a IRA and it's here and the market goes down and the value goes down. And then at that point, you did your conversion, you're converting money over to the Roth, and then it comes back. Now that all has grown tax-free. So that was one thing we were sharing with people back in March is if you're going to do a conversion, do it now because your the value has gone down. You can move it from a taxable account to a tax-free account. You're paying less. You're, you're putting it all basically on sale. You're moving it from one bucket to the other, and then that bucket has since grown back. And now that's all tax-free, so it's it's a better better bit. And I think that answer is maybe JC's question, who came in right at the last minute. There, can you take a hundred k from IRA and reinvest into uh, Roth in light of the COVID provision? You you can you you could. Um, it's a that's a little bit trickier, right? So there's a little bit of a tricky trickiness where it's you're converting, uh, you're not taking the distribution, so. There's, that's a little bit tricky there because you're going to be taking it. That might be a CPA question, but if you take out the uh, 100,000, now that's income and now you've converted it over to a raw. Uh, seems like you could. I might want to confirm that uh, with a CPA to, to verify that, JC. So I appreciate that. Great question again. Too. Yeah, that was a great question question. And again, going back to, to the election, um, will the market crash? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that that go along with that, not just the presidency, but can we get stimulus passed? Uh, can we um, can we handle COVID? I mean, there are so many things that go into that question right now that it's crazy to think that, uh, you know, a presidential election isn't enough. <laughs> there are so many other factors right now that are um, affecting everybody and affecting the market, certainly day to day. John, awesome advice today. And, and of course, for all of you who joined in on the conversation, we thank you for asking your questions, sharing your experiences, 
And of course, if you want to check out the rest of our content, including John's previous webinar about how to avoid scams, you can log on to www.seniorlivinglive.com. John, thank you so much once again for sharing your knowledge with us today. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for taking the time. I know it's before supper time, so I appreciate y'all taking the time. And again, if I can be of any resource, Melissa has my information. We're going to put that here at the end so that we'll have my, all my contact information. If you have any follow-up questions, I'm happy to help you out. Appreciate it. You can all see how much John enjoys, <laughs> enjoys talking money and enjoys uh, helping others. And so, John, we, we always appreciate you. Come on anytime uh, and share your knowledge with us. Uh, and thank you all for watching Senior Living Live. As always, have a fantastic day, everybody.